Close your eyes and imagine. What if the things in life that cause us the greatest pain, the things that bring us grief, are challenges? Challenges designed to help us grow to ultimately become what we were always meant to be. We feel like we've been buried, but what if, like a seed, we've been planted? And having been planted, we grow to become a mighty tree. Now, open your eyes. Open your eyes to this way of viewing life. Come with me as we explore your true, infinite, eternal nature. This is Grief to Growth, and I am your host, Brian Smith. Hey everybody, this is Brian Smith, back with another episode of Grief to Growth, and today I've got with me Jonathan Asley. Uh, Jonathan's written a book about uh, dating in midlife, and Jonathan also has a son that's in spirit, and uh, we call those shining light parents. People have, uh, have children's spirits. So I'm going to introduce Jonathan. We're going to talk about uh, relationships. We're going to talk about grief and, and those types of things. Um, so Jonathan is um, one of America's leading midlife dating coaches and is expanding a deeper essential philosophy of what it truly means to love. After Jonathan lost his 19-year-old son, Connor, in 2018, his grief led him on a soul-searching inner journey where he became aware of an often overlooked dimension of the dating conversation. And he realized the process of dating reveals the most common emotional health issue faced by many singles that are seeking a partner, and that is a distressing lack of self-love, self-work, self-regard, and self-love. So today he's on a mission of encouraging both women and men to fully love themselves in his book that's entitled What the Heck is Self-Love Anyway, which is packed with fun, engaging spiritual and personal growth practices, his dynamic midlife mastery mentorship program that inspires hundreds of people daily around the world, and Jonathan's podcast, What Will Love Do? And his website is jonathanasley.com, and I'll put that in the show notes, but it's Jonathan, J-O-N-A-T-H-O-N, Asley, A-S-L-A-Y.com. So with that, I want to welcome Jonathan Asley to Grief to Grow. I'm excited to be here. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, Jonathan, it's, it is really good to have you on. We were just talking uh, right before we got started. We have something in common, our children yeah. in spirit, and we found out they're almost exactly the same age. Your son, Connor, passed in 2018 at the age of 19. Uh, my daughter, Shana, passed in 2015 at the age of 15. Yeah. So when Connor passed, how did it impact you? Um, wow, I, I can't believe I just got <laughs> um, So obviously my reaction is, is yeah. just a, a snippet of how it impacted me. I, I think as a parent, uh, and, and I'm, I know this is true for most parents, but I can only speak for myself. I, mm -hmm. I think the moment my first son and my second son, Connor, were born, I, I lived in constant fear on some level. I mean, while there's, this is this joyous thing to have this bundle of, you know, this energy and baby and whatnot, I lived in fear of things like, you know, would they drown in the swimming pool? Would they get kidnapped? I mean, boy, anytime I saw something on a kidnapping, I'd go, ah, I'd lose my mind. Yeah. Um, or worse, you know, they'd end up in jail or something like that. So I had all these constant fears. And so the moment I heard he passed away, it was not just, it was like all those fears realized in that second. Um, and I, I wanna say, I didn't ever think this couldn't happen to me, but on some level, like this couldn't happen to me kind of thing. And when I say me experiencing this, is, but yet the fear, you know, I'm a little, it's interesting. I'm very tongue tied, which is very rare. So mm -hmm. this, th that question hit me because um, I recognized that on some level, I was prepared for it. Mm -hmm. Not because, you know, any expectation from him, but I've been doing a ton of personal development and spiritual work prior. Mm -hmm. And a lot of that work prepared me for it from an emotional perspective. So why I got tongue-tied was my, my mind was all in fear and, and that anxiety, but ultimately when it happened, I was relatively calm. Now, I want to differentiate between the shock kind of calm right. that happens or denial that can happen. But on some level, I was calm. And I want to share that a little bit deeper uh, later on in the podcast. But mm -hmm. um, 
so when it happened, I was I had these mixed feelings from all that anxiety that I'd always had versus the, also the reaction that I was relatively calm. And I know that sounds counterintuitive, but no, um, I can I totally relate to that. Um, for myself, I had a, a, a massive fear of death, of my own death. Yeah. Um, so I did a lot of personal development studying to to try to alleviate my own fears. So um, and I think as as a parent, we're always worried about our kids. We always yeah. think, you know. What if the worst things happen? Because it, it, I mean, yeah. that there are lives. So um, I, I would say I could totally relate to what you're saying because I was in a sense prepared because of all the studying I had done, yeah. uh, but I never really expected it to happen to me. And yeah. that's how it is. It feels like when your kid dies, it happens to you, right? It's, it's a personal thing. Oh boy, is that such a, like all of a sudden, everything you've ever watched before, seeing someone else's kid pass away or something happen, bam, now it's, I don't want to say your turn, but your experience. And I will say one thing that did happen right off the bat. There was a rush of love from people. I mean, the, the empathy and sympathy and the arms that, you know, were wrapping me on a virtual level was just, it was humongous. Um, and I really appreciate all the love and support. And I mean, to this day, I still do. But uh, in those early days, that made a huge difference um, in navigating this. Yeah, well, it's, I mean, it's still relatively soon for you. Um, you said it was, it was 28, uh, 2018 when you passed, right? Yeah, it'll be two years in July. So Yeah. So um, those first two years are just like, I mean, it, first of all, it's shock. And then it's, you know, it's disbelief and, you know, all those yeah. things that we go through. So you, um, it, it seems like you must have been prepared in some way for you to have turned as quickly as you did to, you know, writing the book that you wrote and, and those things. Yeah, I, right, uh, right before he passed, it was interesting. I, I study A Course in Miracles. Ah, and, okay. um, and I, j I just began a study group where we uh, we meet every morning on the phone with a group of people and we talk about each lesson and there's 365 lessons in the book. And coincidentally, we were talking about death literally weeks, like four weeks beforehand. I mean, a lot of the, the, the topics were coming up around death and the spiritual significance of death and how the, you know, while the physical body might die, the spirit never dies. And mm -hmm. so, I was able to lean into that energy in the beginning because I'd already kind of prepared myself from the, the mental state of going, okay, yes, our body may transition, but our spirit never does. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's interesting you mentioned A Course of Miracles. I just started, I just kind of kind of came across that actually since my daughter passed. And okay. I just interviewed a guy that's kind of the world's leading expert in that a couple weeks ago. Okay. So that'll be coming out on the podcast and people can find out more about that. But yeah, those things, they do seem to kind of prepare us, but we still go through that, that shock and that, and it doesn't, it doesn't, um, it makes it easier, but it doesn't alleviate the grief, right? It doesn't make it go away. Um, yeah. so what was I, your grief process like when, when, when Connor did pass? <sighs> Have you ever seen that meme where there's like, it's like a roller coaster, you know, this is grief. You know, yeah. it's like all over yeah. the place. Yeah. Um, certainly I experienced, you know, the, the, you know, denial, um, anger, depression. Um, um, what's it when you want them back? There's a terminal. I can't remember all the terminologies. Um, and I experienced everything in, you know, in a, what felt like a short period of time. Mm -hmm. But what I, I really leaned into, I remember, okay, so I was at his funeral and I was giving the eulogy and I've been sharing stories about him and whatnot. And I stopped in the middle and I said, I'm going to make a conscious choice to grieve with love. Hmm. I'm going to make a conscious choice to grieve with love because I recognized on some level that I could grieve with suffering. And if you knew my son and, you know, and I, and I know everyone can say this to some degree, but at least I feel this directly with my son, there is not one ounce of him that would ever want anyone who cared for him to ever suffer. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you just knew his personality and, and how much he cared about his friends and his family and how much he gave love in that sense, 
that would be like the furthest thing he'd ever want. So I'm, I'm giving his eulogy and I stop in the middle and I say, I'm gonna grieve with love. And I decided to really lean into, what does it mean to love? Yeah. Because I can, I can love him and I can just choose to love him in a different way, not his mortal body, but certainly the spiritual aspect of him. So that really inspired me to want to look at love in a different way. And then two months into, or two months after he passed away, I began writing my second book. Um, as you mentioned, oh, here's a picture of it. What the yeah. heck is self-love anyway? Yeah. Um, and it inspired me. And I actually published it nine months to the day after he passed. Wow. Wow. So that, that's, so what led you, so obviously you were on some sort of a self-discovery journey before yeah. he passed. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. So what, what started you on that self-discovery journey before he passed? Oh, well, see now what's interesting because, um, let's see, it was about 12 years before he passed. Uh, I went through a divorce, lost my quarter million dollar a year job and got wiped out in the market crash of 2008. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm, and I'm talking about a seven figure wipeout. So, um, at one point I was worth, you know, well over a million dollars. And then mm -hmm. in three months that was gone. Wow. And I, I hit rock bottom. I mean, I was at the point where I went to bed wishing I didn't wake up. And, and I, I began, I remember the movie, the secret came out right about that time. And I'm like watching this and I'm like, this resonates with me. Hmm. And then I grabbed, I watched another movie called What the Bleep, and then I started to read books about personal development. Tony Robbins, you know, was popular. I mean, he still is, but very popular at that time. And yeah. so I had some Tony Robbins uh, CDs and that sort of thing. So I started to immerse myself in personal development. At the same time, I'm curled up on my couch, closed the drapes, and didn't want to live. So, I mean, there was this interesting dynamic. And in fact, I mean, to add to that, I was addicted to online dating. Hmm. I was like addicted because I was like, so wanted the feminine energy. I wanted to connect with women, which eventually became my profession, <laughs> this <laughs> addiction. So I had three things going on, my depression, my addiction, and then my curiosity for personal development. And I say that all of that work prepared me for the emotional chaos. It was like a vaccination to emotional chaos. Mm -hmm. So by the time he had passed, which I thought would have brought me over to the edge and never returned, right. I had done so much work on myself, and hence why I'm wearing a t-shirt that says self-love, um, is that I was a little bit prepared. I mean, it doesn't take away from the pain, but it was a little bit easier than had I not been prepared, or at least that's my perception anyway. Yeah, you know, it's it's really interesting, you know, talking to you, Jonathan, and, and going through your life and looking backwards. Um, there's a quote that I always talk about was, you know, life can only be understood looking backwards, but we have to live it forward. And yeah. as we look back, you know, going through your life, it's kind of like, okay, well, this prepared me for this, and this prepared me for this. And it's, you know, it's just reality. A lot of times the worst things in our lives are the things that really make us stronger. They're the, or, or I, I would say reveal our strength. It reveals a strength that we didn't know we have. Yeah. But, but we go through that, you know, like, like you said, curled up on the couch, you wake up in the morning, you don't want to be there. And anybody that's lost a kid can relate to that feeling. I think, yeah. I think we've all had that. We've had those days and, you know, still have those days sometimes where it's like, you know, why am I still here and he's not? But, uh, you know, it's, it's interesting how you, you've taken that and used that to, to motivate yourself to move forward. Yeah, it, 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 it's literally as if I'm drawing on his inner strength. I mean, I, I continually tap into um, what he had because he had an unusual, my son was unusual. Um, in fact, one of the chap, can I curse? Yes, yes. Sure. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, one of the chapters in the book is don't let anyone fuck with your chi. And what was interesting about my son is he had this unique capacity not to let other people's opinion of him bother him. Mm -hmm. Like, in other words, he was Teflon. Like, it's like, if that's who you are, fine. And so I recognized that there was an element of he loved himself so much that other people's opinions of him wouldn't bother him. Hmm. 
Whereas his dad was the opposite. If someone had an opinion of me that wasn't good, I mean, I was like, <laughs> I'd curl up and, and, uh, and, and shrink emotionally. So I started to tap into that inner strength with him hmm. uh, since the day he passed. You know, it's, you know, it's another thing I find interesting when I talk to people whose children passed early, this is a, it's anecdotal, but you know, it's yeah. been my observation. These kids seem to usually have something really special about them that, that, that draws people to them and that we learn from our children. My, my daughter was just like, she was kind of similar. She was like, she had so much self-confidence and she loved herself and she, she did what she wanted to do. You know, she was kind of her own person. She was 15, but she was a feminist. Uh, remember she wore this t-shirt, this sweatshirt to school one day, that, you know, that feminist across it. One of her teachers was like, you know, I want one of those t-shirts. She had my, she had my, uh, my wife make it for her. Yeah. So yeah, there's something about our kids that, you know, even after they pass, we're still drawing strength and inspiration from them. So I, I'm just curious, do you believe in soul planning? Do you think that you and, and your son planned this or? Oh, well, so you're going to find this interesting. Um, there's two facets to what I'm about to share. So, um, my son struggled in school. He struggled with reading and writing. Um, and, you know, whether he had a learning disability or not, I mean, I believe he did. Mm -hmm. um, he graduated high school and he said, look, I, I don't want to go to college, even though his, young, his older brother was straight A student, magna cum laude, double major, you know, like Stepford kid from, the, from an educational standpoint. Connor struggled. Mm -hmm. And and then, of course, then his mom said, um, well, we want you to get a job. And he said to me right after graduation, he said, Dad, can you give, cut me some slack? Can you give me one year to figure out my life? In other words, can you give me time just to, because I don't want to go to college. I don't want to get a job yet. I want to figure out things on my own. Um, he passed one year and three days from the day he said that. Hmm. And there's no doubt in my mind that his soul knew he was here for a short journey. Like yeah. his soul knew it. Like in that moment, his soul was telling me, I'm only here for a year. And in that one year, he lived balls to the wall. I mean, he was very, uh, he had a very much a rebel uh, personality mm -hmm. in him. And he tried and experimented in all different areas of his life. So he got to have a lot of fun his last year, especially with his core group of friends. Yeah. Um, you know, that, that's really, really interesting to me um, because my daughter made little comments here or there that made us think, you know, looking back on it, that she knew she wasn't going to be here for, you know, for yeah. a very long time. Um, and, and that seems to be, you know, fairly common. And, and she was the same way. She just loved life. She just wanted to experience everything you know, and try different things. And, and so, you know, I, I see some commonalities there. So yeah. I think it's great when we can look back as parents and realize that and maybe realize, you know, that was the plan and not, you know, agon I mean, we still wish they were here, but not agonize so much about the fact that that was their journey and they, they completed their journey. And now we got to go, you know, do our own thing. Yeah, that's what I got out of, in the, you know, got out of the Course in Miracles. And it's great that you're, you know, you know, investigating it for yourself. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things I recognize that we're all here on our own journey. So when I was able to say, okay, this was his journey. In other words, you know, some people have, you know, I look at it like a movie and his was a short film. Okay. Some people have movies that are a long drawn out drama. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Some are action adventure. Some are romantic comedies, you know, and the, the length of the movie kind of, is an impetus for how your life is. So in his case, it was a short documentary, especially the last year, balls to the wall kind of uh, energy. And I was okay with that. In other words, because that's his journey. Yeah. And I, I was wanting to share with you the second part of the story um, was the day after he passed, I'm walking into my complex and there's kind of this, where I live, there's a, like a little uh, waterfall and vegetation and a little pond and that sort of thing right through the entrance. It's very beautiful. Mm -hmm. And I see a yellow butterfly just kind of passing by me. I'm like, oh, that's kind of interesting. And I didn't give it much thought at first until when I was leaving the next morning and this yellow butterfly starts following me. I'm like, okay, this is kind of interesting because I'd never seen a yellow butterfly before where I lived. Mm. I always saw brown butterflies. 
And then the next day, so now it's the third day after he passed. And I'm at my, I, I live on a, a third story of a three story complex. Mm -hmm. And right out my balcony is a yellow butterfly. And there is no doubt in my mind that was him yeah. saying, hey, I want to let you know I'm okay. And now I see yellow butterflies all the time. I mean, not, you know, not every single day. Right. But I mean, it's literally now that's my signal to know that's him telling me, hey, I'm just letting you know I'm around and I'm okay. Yeah, I think that's great. And, you know, it's interesting that you, that you bring it up because I, you know, I talk to a lot of parents and a lot of parents will say, well, I haven't heard from my son. I haven't ever heard from my kid. Why haven't I heard from them? And that's one of the ways they communicate with us. It's not typically going to be a phone call. Even though I know people that have gotten phone calls, uh, but it's, it's, it's usually like little things. It's, it's synchronicities. It's finding coins. It's finding feathers. And then once they find something that connects with you, they'll start to repeat that, you know, yeah. for, so like for my daughter and I, it's, it's dimes. And you know, it's, it's really wild because this happened to me just two days ago. I was looking for something in the house that my, my dog had lost. She had lost her toy. I asked my daughter, could you, you know, give me an idea of where her toy is? Yeah. And I, I just, so I was like, okay, check between the cushions on the couch. I ran my hand between the put cushions on the couch. It wasn't her toy, but I found a dime. Oh. And it was like, okay, well, that was, that was interesting. So yeah. we look for little things like that. You know, our kids are, they're still connected with us. They're still, you know, they still want to be involved in our lives. And I think it's, it's really great to hear someone like yourself saying, yeah, I recognize these things. I, I recognize that. And, and the idea that another thing that with parents is we think we, we tend to think we own our kids, right? So what happens yeah. to them happens to us and their life was cut short. Why did this happen to me? And that's a really common thing that people say. And it's like, it didn't happen to us. It happened to them. Exactly. And that was their journey. Yes, exactly. It took, it took that particular bit of awareness to help me accept, hey, this is his journey. It didn't happen to me. He didn't do anything to me. You know, he didn't, this wasn't intentional on his part or anything. Right. And, and, and it wasn't at the hand of someone else per se. So, um, and that awareness really helps me be more in acceptance. Because ultimately, I think what helped me navigate the grief um, was leaning into love and leaning into acceptance. In other words, just, and, and don't get me wrong, I, the, you know, it's almost two years and I, I, you know, I was crying the other day and I mean, I, I literally was melancholy for a, an entire afternoon. Mm -hmm. Not that I was incessantly thinking about them, but there's a, there's a, there's a sadness, there's a hole inside of, I can only speak for myself and I'm, I'm almost certain you and everyone else feels the same way. There's a hole inside of us. Um, I just do my best to fill that hole with as much love as I can possibly can for myself, for him, for everyone on the planet. Yeah, I had a grief counselor that came by the house uh, right after Shana passed and she said that it was really profound. I think she, she like had this model of the heart and she said, so when, you're, when Shana passed, it left a hole in your heart and now the edges are ragged and they're rough and they're raw. Yeah. The hole will always be there, yeah. but the edges will smooth over. Yeah. And there will always be a place in my heart for her. There will always be a longing for her. I will always miss her. Yeah. Um, and I don't, I don't intend for that to change. I don't want that to change. I, I want to, you know, to have that for her because that, that's my love for her. Yeah. But it doesn't have to be raw every day and it's not as bad every day. And when it is bad, you know, we deal with it and we realize it's going to pass. So we lean into those feelings. We have those feelings and, and then we let them go and we move on. Yeah. Um, I don't know if it's appropriate to share with your audience, um, but I've done some spiritual journeys using plant-based medicine. Oh yeah. Yeah. To, um, <laughs> and actually each time I've done it in the last year and I've done it three times, um, I've connected with him. I mean, I right. connected with him on a deep level. And one of the messages he sent me, which I thought was very profound, was um, I was kind of playing with the, my eyes open and my, my eyes closed because when you're on the medicine, everything is kind of euphoric and kind of a dreamlike state. And there was a bright, shining light. And he says, hey, Dad, you don't have to close your eyes because the light of love is just engulfing you right now. Hmm. And just always remember the light of love is on. So you don't have to. And what I think he meant when he said that was closing your eyes is like being afraid 
being a, a fear, not of him, but just in life in general. Mm -hmm. He's like, keep your eyes open, open your eyes to love, and that will get you through anything. And it was like, that message came in so loud and clear. Um, as well as he said one other thing, he said, Grat be grateful because I'm already in the light of love. Mm -hmm. Like, in other words, lean into gratitude. I'm already in love. I'm in mm -hmm. that space of love. And that's, be grateful for that. You'll get there, he's what he's saying, you know, but I'm already there. <laughs> yeah, I think that is so awesome. And uh, I'm curious, was it ayahuasca that you did? Um, no, I did uh, psilocybin. <laughs> okay, yeah. Well, you know, it's they're, they're doing experiments with psilocybin, and there's just yeah. some real medical benefit to psilocybin. Oh, I mean, God, I'm, yeah. not, I'm not promoting it, but yeah, there's people for depression and anxiety, and they're using yeah. it in medical settings. And yeah. we're starting to understand plant-based medicines. And um, yeah. I have friends that have that have taken ayahuasca and I've, I've been interested in it because as a, as a medicine, you know, not as a recreational thing. And I think, yeah, exactly. I do it as a spiritual journey. Yeah. It can, right. it can open up our eyes to a greater reality that our brain filters out. I mean, we've got, yeah. we've got these senses that are, that kind of block everything else out. So I think that's really cool. And I think it's a universal message that we can all, you know, take to heart. And again, as parents, you know, when our children leave before us, we miss them. A lot of people grieve for our children. Like they miss this, they miss that. And it's really yeah. important mess message to say they didn't miss anything They're As you said, he's in the light of love. You yeah. know, he, he's, he's in bliss that, that we'll get to soon enough. Yeah. My ex-wife struggles a bit because she has that. I'm, I, I want to say the word fantasy um, and please forgive it. Cause there's probably a better word, but you know, like, he getting married, having children, yeah, she being yeah. a grandma to, you know, to his children. So she has this missing of that, which I don't have that same strength and desire. You know, like I don't have that same desire as she did per se. Uh, I just, I miss him because I liked my son. <laughs> like, yeah, you know, yeah. it's interesting. I, I, and actually both of my boys. I mean, what's interesting is a lot of parents may love their children but they don't necessarily like their children. Right, right. And, and and both my boys were polar opposites. I mean, they were as far, I mean, <laughs> they could be so two different people. But I really liked them. Yeah. And what I miss most is I just liked hanging out with them. Yeah. I don't know how else to describe it. No, I think it's a great way to describe it because I like both my girls. And yeah. Shana was, is the younger. Uh, she's three years younger than my daughter, uh, Kayla. And I... I miss her being here for her sister. You know, I, yeah. I, I miss that. Um, I, you know, I didn't have the fantasies of grandchildren and stuff like that. That's just, some people do. I, I don't. Yeah. So I don't, I don't really miss that. Um, but there are times, you know, she would be a sophomore in college now and she was going to go to my alma mater. So mm. you know, there are times when I, I do, I miss those things, but it's for me. Right. Um, she was, she was a few weeks away from getting her attempts to start driving. And she was really excited about, you know, driving. And it was funny yeah. because uh, one of the readings I had with the medium, she said, Shana is handing me car keys. Why is she handing me car keys? And she's like, I th and I told her she was 15 and a half. And she said, I think she's telling me she's driving on the other side. And she's, <laughs> she's like, I don't know if it's literal. I don't know if they really have cars there. But yeah. you know, she's, she's telling, she's giving me this message. She's not missing that, right? You know, yeah. we're, we're missing those things, but they're not. Yeah. Oh my God. Thanks for sharing that. <laughs> so cool. Yeah. But you know, our kids, um, and I feel this from you. I mean, my kids are my life. I mean, my, I, I didn't understand you talk about self-love. I didn't understand unconditional love until my children were born. I mean, that, yeah. that's, that's when you look at that kid and you go, wow, I would do anything for you. And there's nothing that you could do that would make me, you know, not love you. And, and you love them, you know, whatever they do, whatever their thing is. And my girls were very different um, in, yeah. in some ways. Uh, but you love both of them, you know, and you love them differently, but equally. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. You mentioned unconditional love. And I, I think as a parent, and on some level, and hate, I'm about to use the word hate, but it's, it, there's another word. I just, that's the only one that comes to mind. On some level, I hated being a parent because unconditional love can feel incredibly overwhelming. Mm -hmm. because. I want to protect them. I don't want them to ever get hurt. I, you know, I mean, everything about wanting them to be incredibly safe was also a huge pressure for yeah. me. Yeah. I mean, and so 
I don't get me wrong. I love my kids, but parenting unconditional love was felt like a burden at times. It makes you vulnerable. You know, I, I, yeah, had a, I remember exactly. before, before we had kids, I had a, a friend that um, had a child and she said, having a child is like taking your heart out of your chest and letting it walk around in the world, you know, and it's totally yeah. exposed because you realize how vulnerable you are. You know, if something happens to your, for, to your child and with Shana, our, our girls were both healthy for you know most of their lives, but then Shana was diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis, which okay. was pretty serious um, when she was about 10, I think. And okay. then like a year or so later, she was diagnosed with a heart condition. Okay. Um, so we went from her being like, you know, really healthy to, you know, me having to be concerned about her with the medications I was giving her and the things we were going through. And that's, you're right. It's, ex it's, it's extremely, it makes you vulnerable. Um, yeah. But it's worth it, you know. It's 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 worth it. I wouldn't trade it for anything in the world. But um, you know, they're they're they become your lives. I I want to say that the one thing that happened the moment he passed was that eight hundred pound gorilla that I was carrying about unconditional love on some level disappeared. Mm -hmm. In other words, I and. It disappeared not because he wasn't here. It's because in that moment, I recognized how valuable life really becomes, how important every single day matters. And so my, my last memory of my son was we, we get together. We got together for lunch twice a week. I mean, we get together for lunch. We, you know, she, you know go to different places. We'd always go to one of his, either yeah, we go to his favorite places, always order the same food, but we had three restaurants. Mm -hmm. And two days before he passed was the last time I saw him. And we always said goodbye the same way. I love you, you know, and with a hug and I'll see you later. Yeah. And I'm grateful that on some level, that's my last memory of him. Yeah. Like his, you know, um, because sadly, his mother doesn't have that. His mother, um, he, he woke up uh, on a Tuesday morning, went downstairs to have a cup of coffee and go back upstairs. And his mother saw him. And then he passed sometime between 9 a.m. and noon. Mm. Um, and so for her, it's like this, oh, I just expect to see him later in the day. Yeah. You know, yeah. and I at least have a little different memory because that feels... Uh, I know I'm making a big deal about this, or at least it's a big deal for me. I'm so grateful I don't have that experience because that would feel painful to me. Yeah, you know, and I had to, I worked with the guy to do some trauma work because for me, my daughter, the night before, because she was still living here, she was 15. So we were sitting on the couch and we went to bed and she goes up to the bathroom and she was in the bathroom, the door was closed. So I just said, you know, good night through the door. I didn't hug her that night. I, every, every night I would hug her and give her a kiss, but I, that yeah. night I didn't. And mm -hmm. then the next morning she didn't wake up. Uh. So my last memory was finding her, you know, in bed the next day. Yeah. Um, but the thing our, our kids tell us when they come through, through mediums or through after death communications is, I don't want you to remember the last moment. If you have a memory like you, that's great. Yeah, but, it's, it's kind of, for me, I lean into that. Now. Yeah, I think it's, I, I think it's great yeah. that, that you have that, but I'm like, you know, I could, I could agonize over the fact that I didn't kiss her that night. You know, I yeah. could say that was my last moment. Why didn't I kiss her? But I, I don't, you know, I kissed her every other night before that. Yeah. And she knows I love her. And in fact, she would even say to me sometimes, you don't have to tell me you love me all the time. You know, I know it, <laughs> but uh, I'm like, no, I'm going to tell you anyway. By the way, now let me ask you something. So you have another child, right? So with my, with my other son, I'm like, look, <laughs> we're going to hug and kiss every single time we see each other. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I went, Every communication between us always to be, I love you at the end. I put a little pressure on him a little bit mm -hmm. because of this. And I'm, I say, look, cut me some slack. And he's, he's actually understanding. <laughs> yeah, I think that's natural. How old is your other son? Uh, he, well, they're three years apart. So he was 22. Um, okay. But he's yeah. 24 now. Okay. So yeah, same as my girls. Uh, yeah. my, my daughter will be 24. Uh, Kayla will be 24 uh, this fall in November. Okay. Wow. Um, so I mean, we have exactly. Yeah. So we always, you know, and I, the thing is, this goes back to my past, but I always hug my girls and kiss them because I was like, I'm going to overcompensate for my, my childhood. So I, <laughs> I, I do that anyway. But I was telling Kayla the other day, she called me on the phone and she goes, what was that sigh when you answered the phone? I said, 
because you only call me when something is wrong. For one thing, <laughs> you, she texts me. I mean, they, they, don't get me wrong. She texts me. She, but I said, you only call when something's wrong. So, so the other thing is you have to understand, I'm still going through PTSD, right? Yeah. And, and I'm going to be for the rest of my life. So when you call, when the phone rings and it's you, you know, tell us, first of all, I'm okay. That's going to yeah. be the first thing out of your mouth. Yeah. I'm okay. And she's learned. She, she is, that's, that's her burden to bear for the rest of her life. <laughs> you know what? Identical with my son. I literally, if you're calling me, just start with everything's okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They, they got to cut us some slack on that. I think that's perfectly, I think that's, yeah. that's fine. I think we deserve that. Yeah. So, um, so after Connor passed, you write this book about self-love. So why is self-love so important? So what was interesting, thank you for asking, because right before he passed as a dating and relationship coach, I, I uncovered what I, I started to uncover how much dating triggers the number one emotional health issue. You, you said that in my bio. And mm -hmm. what, what I meant was that I've observed that most humans, at least here in the United States, and I'm sure this is around the world as well, is that we suffer from, I don't, I don't feel good enough. I don't feel lovable. I'm not likable. Our self-worth um, is somewhat fragile on some level. And while we love the idea of confidence, you know, um, that underneath that maybe facade of confidence, many people are experiencing this lack of self-worth, self-esteem, mm -hmm. self-confidence. And dating triggers this, you know, whether it's ghosting or breakups or narcissist or cheating or all these different things that can happen in the dating realm, it triggers that experience of not, I'm not good enough. So I started to blog about self-love as the antidote to that, really as the, as the precursor to building up your self-worth, self-esteem, self-confidence. Mm -hmm. And then by the time he passed, I, I, as I said earlier, I was leaning into love. Like, how do I incorporate both? My, my book isn't about dating. It's more about the individual, your individual sovereignty, if you will. Um, mm -hmm. And as I kind of wrap up in the book, I say it's a vaccination to emotional chaos because whether it's the passing of a loved one or a breakup or ghosting or whatever happens in one's life, it could be uh, health issues and whatnot. When we have a solid core of loving ourselves, we're better prepared for the roller coaster of life. Yeah. And that's my belief. And that's what I talk about in the book. I think that's fantastic. And, and I, I love the way you, you put that because I think, and I'm starting to figure this out, self-love is the, is the core of everything. It's the, it's the foundation. It's the bedrock, yeah. right? Yeah. So, you know, Jesus said, love your neighbor as you love yourself. And a lot of us learned that in Sunday school. And we were taught that means that, you know, you should love your neighbor. But the first thing is you have to love yourself. And, yes. and that's the thing that a lot of us don't really, you know, understand. And I was talking with the guy last night who's written a book about the 10 life lessons learned from your death experiences. And mm. the, first life, the first lesson, the universal lesson for people at near-death experiences, the other lessons, you know, they might pick up here or there. It's all about unconditional love. It's all about unconditional love. Yeah. And again, the first, the first love is the love for yourself. Yeah. But in our society, we've been taught that self-love is equal to selfish. And we shouldn't do that. We should be humble. We should be, you know, we should be um, humble. We should, we should just not think too much of, our, of ourselves. And it, 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 it's, we don't have that foundation, right? So when these things come along, dating breakups, things like that, you know, grief, yeah. it knocks us right off our feet. So what's interesting in The Course of Miracles, we talk about the, it's, it's not stated in this way, so I'm going to give you my interpretation of it. There's the unhealthy ego, because when we talk about self, we're talking about ego, and there's, there, there is an element of unhealthy ego that either tax ourselves, there's a you know, self-crucifixion that can happen, or we judge others or compare ourselves to others and that sort of thing. That's really coming from unhealthy ego. Mm -hmm. healthy ego says I'm going to love on myself like I would that little kid you know like a little kid inside of you I'm just going to love on you not from a selfish place but from an empowered place from a place of strength from within and I, I start off the beginning chapter you know, the opening of my book talking about when you're on the airplane and everyone knows that when you get on an airplane the flight attendant says in the case of cabin pressure change 
oxygen mask will drop. And if you're traveling with small children, put the oxygen mask on yourself first because you can't be of service to someone else if you can't be of service to yourself. So the oxygen that's coming on that plane is love. Yeah. That's, what I, that's what I'm leaning into is mm -hmm. when we give ourselves an oxygen of love, we can then be of service to others. And yet we've been so conditioned that it's the other way around. Yes. And, and judged is if, if you don't do it that way, you know, if, you, if it's all about giving, and there's little room for you, how can you be of value to anyone else anyway? Yeah. So that's what I lean into. I, I you know, as I've done a lot more studying and I, I, a lot of these new age, you know, teachings, I guess I'll say, yeah. there's been a huge attack on the ego. Um, the, the ego is bad. We need to kill the ego and the eagles. And I was just reading a book about enlightenment. This guy is just like, the ego is the enemy. And I, I think that's overdone, in my, my yeah. personal opinion. And I was talking with the guy, I was telling you the, a little bit earlier, Bob Perry, who's like an expert on the Course of Miracles, and we yeah. he was talking about the ego in the Course of Miracles, and I said, you know, my impression is, I think, you know, Freud talked about the id, the ego, and the super ego. Yeah, and I think we're attacking the id or the ego when we should be attacking the id because it's the id that's all about me, me, me. But the ego is healthy. We have to have an ego. We have to have boundaries. We have to have an understanding of ourselves. Yeah. We have to take care of ourselves. There's, there's nothing wrong with that. I think we. I think we've gotten out of balance with the whole That's thing. That's why I differentiate it for me. This is my interpretation because the book doesn't say it that way, but it's healthy ego versus unhealthy ego. Yeah. That's just my way of phrasing it. But it's the recognition that whenever I'm attacking myself, because I could judge myself horrifically, yeah. or I can judge others, or I compare myself to others, or I'm in guilt, or I'm in resentment, all of those experiences are born out of fear and ego, the yes. unhealthy aspects of life, because it's really born out of fear. So the healthy part of ego, the way I interpret it, is how can we lean more into love? Yeah. And, you know, it's interesting, though, a lot of people throw around the word love. Oh, I'm very loving. I'm very giving. I'm always this. But oftentimes, it's still coming from a selfish place. Mm -hmm. You know, I need you to be this way for me to feel good. Right. Instead of, hey, I'm just going to give no matter what happens. <laughs> right. Right. It's, it's giving with the proper motivation. And it's, yeah. and it's understanding that we're all equal and we're all really the same. And if you're, if you were really all one, and yeah. if you really understand that, then you will love other people, but you'll also love yourself. And I think, as I said, I, I really like what, what I hear you saying about, you know, self-love being the foundation for this, whether it's dating or whether it's going through grief or going through anything is primarily looking at, you know, who you really are, what value you have, you know, in and of yourself. And, and if you have that and you're in a dating situation and someone dumps you, you're not going to dump on yourself and say, well, they, they, they dump me because I don't deserve to be loved, which, you know, can happen, right? Well, I'm in a world, well, I coach women <laughs> and they oftentimes take it. Well, I mean, it's human nature to take it personally. In other mm -hmm. words, as if it's a sign of your worth. And I'm here to say, hey, when someone, for example, ends a relationship, and they're basically saying we're misaligned. That's all it's saying is we are not aligned with one another right. for whatever. Then the reason is irrelevant because if they're choosing to move on, that's their choice. That going back to the journey. The, the unhealthy ego says there's something wrong with me. And I think, I'm going to tell you why I think this happens. I think that the unhealthy ego enters in our lives every day in some way, shape, or form as the trigger to love yourself. Hmm. In other words, it's, it's because here's the thing. As children, we've been so conditioned to experience love from others. We were never really trained as children to learn how to love on ourselves. Yeah. It's, we get love from others. So I think the ego is constantly putting, you know, these little tests in your way so you can return back to love. In fact, another great book to read is Return to Love by Marianne Williamson. Hmm. Um, in fact, at the end of my book, I actually take you on a chronicle of the 20 years of personal development I've been through. Okay. And I recommend what I believe are some of the best books on the planet to really shore up one's self-love. At least these are the ones that I most, you know, resonated with. Yeah. Well, it's interesting that you say that because uh, I think a lot of times we do tend to, 
we try everything until we find something that works, right? So trying to find love from other people and relying on that, you know, relying yeah. on them for our own self-worth, we eventually figure out this is not working. And we get to the rock bottom that you referred to earlier. And we all reach it at different points through different ways at different times. Yeah. And I heard someone the other day, and I wish I could remember who it was so I could give them credit, but they were saying, you know, rock bottom is really a blessing because it's what motivates you to start moving up. And, after, and when you hit rock bottom, there's only one way to go. So once we get to that point where we've said, okay, I've tried this, I've tried this, I've tried this, yeah. uh, and it's not working. Let me, let me try something different. Let me try turning within as, as uh, you know, as Kelvin Chin, a guy I've, I've interviewed also said, you know, it's, it's that turning within where we yeah. start to say, let me look at my own, my own self-worth. Let me look at my, yeah. let me love on myself. Let me get that, that, uh, that motivation, that feedback from myself. And if I do that first, then I can love other people and then I'll get the love that I need in return. And if someone says, I don't want to be with you, I can say, like you said, we're misaligned, not you're worthless, uh, which yes, is why some people exactly. hear that. Yeah. Um, it's hard to do it when you're in depression. Yeah. There's, there's no doubt. And, and I even talk about in this in my book, I'm not, you know, I'm a huge proponent to seeking medical help. You know, if you're, if you feel so far down the rabbit hole is please go out and see, you know, professional help. Mm -hmm. um, not that I'm a big proponent on medicine as a way to curb it, because ultimately hope is the only way to, I, I believe having people, when you're in depression, you've lost hope. Yes. I, I feel like that's like the core element. Yeah. So personal development is, is re is shoring up that level of hope. Uh, that's my invitation. But if you need medical treatment and need to see people that are professionals at this, don't go to, you know, some life coach that you saw online and, and no disrespect to life coaches, but uh, because I'm, I'm a life coach, right? but start with professionals because there's a lot of people out there giving quasi advice, you know, to help. And that may take you further down the rabbit hole. Yeah. You know, it's interesting because I'm a life by coach. By the way, let me say one other thing. Mm -hmm. A good life coach knows that and will send you. <laughs> you know. Exactly. That's, that's what I was going to say. I, I'm a oh. life coach myself. And my daughter is a, is a mental health professional. She's in, she's in counseling. She's, our, yeah. she's a mental health counselor and she's working on her master's degree. And I'm, I'm doing this life coaching course right now to, to teach other life coaches. And one of the things they said I, I really liked is, you know, there's a, place for there's a place for life coaches because life coaches are typically looking forward. We help yeah. people to, to understand where you are, to understand what your motivations are, what you want, and to make plans. Yes. If you need a professional counselor to help you look back and figure out why you are where you are and the issues you're having, that's not a life coach. And that's, yes. that's something that we need to understand as life coaches. That's not what we do. So we refer people that, that need counseling to counselors. But if you're in a situation where you, you feel like I'm stuck, I, I know what I want to do, but I just can't get there. That's where a life coach can, can help. Yes, exactly. Well said, Brian. Well said. So, yeah, I think, um, you know, what we're talking about, though, I think it really is It's interesting how it applies, like I said, to everybody. I like the way we, we talk, you know, we, we talked, your book's about, ostensibly on the surface, is about dating and your, your relationship coach, but it really applies to everybody because we all could learn how to love ourselves better. Um, well, actually, I don't talk too much about dating in the book. Okay. Uh, it's okay. more le leaning into love in it of itself. I mean, there's a little bit of dating in there. But okay. when, I, when I started to write it, I wanted it to be, I didn't want to pigeonhole myself in the dating realm. Mm -hmm. um, so I spend more about how to shore up your own self-worth, self-esteem, self-confidence, that sort of thing. So they're very simple lessons like, you know, uh, chapter one is called speak your truth, do it with kindness. You know, oftentimes people are afraid to speak up. So the encouragement is to start using your voice yeah. um, in a kind way, in a non-confrontational way. So, and each lesson builds upon itself. So by the time you get to the end of the book, you go, okay, this is a tiny wake up call. Now I'm, this is where I take you as I say, look, now there's these other great resources that you should start checking into, like Course in Miracles, or maybe some workshops, or Wayne Dyer, or Abraham Hicks. I mean, I list all the, the, the people that I love. Yeah. Um, and, have, and so that's really, it's just a tiny wake-up call to 
begin, and I'm a big proponent of a daily personal development practice, it's personal development, self-help, spiritual practice, a daily. And, oh, one other thing, a lot of people confuse self-love with self-care. Hmm. And you know, like getting manicures and massages and bubble baths <laughs> and all those kind of things. And I'm here to say is self-care is for the body. Self-love is for the, for the heart, for the emotional side of who you are. Mm, That's yeah. what self-love is about. Yeah. It's more, and the body is an important part of this too, but self-care is just the body piece that the emotional piece is going to require personal development, self-help and spiritual work, at least in my perspective. Yeah, I agree with you. And that's a conclusion I've come to too. It, it requires a practice and people might, they might shy away from that word practice, but I was yeah. interviewing someone a little while ago and she, she was talking about practice and she said it's three minutes a day. Cause this is what she starts people with. She's like, and she said, and I really don't want you to do any more than that. You know, she, in her, in her approach is like, because if you do, it's going to become overwhelming. She said, so do three minutes a day. And it's, it's just these little things that they don't have to be big. I mean, for me, I, I have a gratitude practice. So before I get out of bed every morning, I think of three things I'm grateful for yeah. and, you know, and, and things like, you know, people shy away from the word meditation, but call it mindfulness. And even if it's just putting on some music and sitting down for five minutes and closing your eyes and listening to a song that inspires you. Yeah. And do do little things like that on a regular basis to kind of, you know, to build yourself up to, to kind of as a daily exercise. I am full agreement. I mean, I, I encourage I encourage everyone to go 15 minutes and that you start with three and go to five and 10 and 15, but at a minimum, get to a level. Uh, this is my request for everyone. Get to a level of a minimum 15 minutes a day at some point, you know, start small, get to that point. And meditation is a great technique. And like you said, it's not about home and just, you know, emptying your mind per se, although that is one technique. It could be listening to music and doing other things. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, Tony Robbins talks about something called the hour of power. And, um, and, and you know, he's a believer that you put invest an hour. I kind of want to encourage people to get to that level at some point, because here's the thing. How many episodes of the Kardashians do people need to watch? How many times do you have to flip through Facebook likes and Instagram likes? Why not redirect at least somewhere between those five minutes you talked about, the 15 minutes, or maybe even get to a point of an hour in really nurturing your own soul? Yeah. Because those other things are merely distractions. And, and God, universe of spirit is saying, I want you to invest in you. Like, yeah. that's what spirit says every day. Yeah. I want you to invest in you. Well, I, I, yeah, look, yeah, look at it as an investment. I would agree with that. Um, I, but, I, you know, it's interesting. I've been meditating for, I don't know how many years now. Uh, and, and I've been meditating daily for the last three years. Um, okay. And I remember talking to friends about meditation though, several years ago. And they're like, I can't sit for five minutes. There's no way I could sit for 20 minutes. So we encourage people to start wherever you are, right? Yes. Uh, and, and for me, I do several things. I have my gratitude practice I mentioned earlier. I take a, yeah. an hour and a half walk every day. I walk seven miles. Um, I, I do a formal sitting down meditation. So I do multiple things throughout the day. But that's where I am after. Okay, so cumulatively, you're doing a fair amount. That's great. Yeah, cumulatively, I'm doing quite a bit. But that, yeah. that's, this is what I do. <laughs> this is, this yeah, is, I was going to say, by the way, let me clarify. I don't mean all in one sitting, yeah, <laughs> an yeah. hour's worth. But certainly get to that place. Um, are you familiar with the Hawaiian forgiveness uh, prayer? I'm not, no. Okay, so I'd like to share with your audience sure, something that great. really helps me. So the Hawaiian forgiveness prayer is called the Hapona Pono 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 Pono, and I'm butchering it a little bit because it might not be exact. Um, it's a very simple prayer, and it said, the, it's nine words. I love you. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Thank you. I'm going to repeat that. I love you. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Thank you. And... It's actually something that you can say to yourself. And what's interesting about this prayer is that it's, it's kind of like, a, it's like an NLP pattern interrupt. So if you're ever feeling mm. fear, anxiety, angst, melancholy, and I'm not talking about deep, you know, deep melancholy or deep uh, depression or anything like that, just those beginning moments where you ever feel anxiety, 
say this prayer, and sometimes I say it 10 times a day, I mean, or 10 times in a moment, mm -hmm. but it actually reshifts your brain patterning mm -hmm. because forgiveness actually means forgiving love. Mm -hmm. And this is a great exercise to give yourself love. So yeah. forgiveness, forgiving love. And I do this throughout the day, whenever I'm feeling a little angst or whatnot. And so there, like what you said, there's all these little things like gratitude, the forgiveness prayer, maybe watching a video, maybe listening to a podcast. All these things are nurturing our soul, mm -hmm. I think on a healthier level than, like I said, the distractions of life because we can get so hypnotized by this little device. Yeah, no, I think it's really- my invitation. Yeah, I, I completely agree with you. And I, that what I try to do with people is offer them as many tools as possible and say, you know, like, here's your toolbox here to, and, and use what resonates with you yeah. and what works for you. And as you said, you know, make it, make it something you do throughout your day. It, it shouldn't be, it hopefully won't be a burden. It shouldn't be a burden. It should be something you look forward to. You should look forward to your, to your meditation time. And if you're, if you're not looking forward to it, then maybe you're using the wrong technique. Maybe you should find yeah, something that works better for you. Yeah, there's all different. That's the beauty of this. There's all there's different cars for every human being kind of thing. And it's the same with personal development. Find what resonates with you. And, and I'm also a big proponent. If you like one teacher, you know, listen to, you know, follow them for a while and then follow someone new. Mix it up. Change it up. Um, don't get pigeonholed sometimes, although, you know, I'm not suggesting abandon them. But change things up because variety is also part of the spice of life. And that's the beauty of those who take this journey yeah. of personal development, self-help and spiritual work, because I believe the end result is a much calmer way of being. Exactly. Where it's yeah. inner peace. And most people are out for the pursuit of happiness I'm in the pursuit of inner peace. <laughs> yeah. Like for me, that's my declaration of independence is the pursuit of inner peace. Cause that feels a lot better than shooting for happiness because the, the yin to the yang will happen. You shoot for happiness all day long. You're going to get the corresponding other side. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think that's really, a, another thing that's really important is that we need to understand that, you know, happiness is, is fleeting. Happiness is based on yeah. circumstances, whereas inner peace, we can, if we, if we can get that inner peace, we know the circumstances come and go. So yeah. even when we are in those, in those turbulent times that are, that are raging around us, we still have that, that, that foundation that we talked about, that core where we say, I know everything is going to be okay. You know, yes. uh, I, I know everything actually is okay. It doesn't appear to be okay. It seems to be chaotic and it sucks right now. And it's okay to say it sucks right now, yeah. but, it, but I know at, at my core, I know where my spirit is that everything is okay. You know, it's interesting, um, my, my mother, who that's in the picture there, my mom and dad, my mother passed away six months before my son. Mm -hmm. So I had two big losses. In fact, my father, who was, and they were married 66 years before she passed. Wow. Um, she she kind of recounted her life. We, we had a little bit of fair warning. I mean, she was diagnosed with cancer and was gone three weeks later. Wow. Um, but we had a chance to connect with her. And as she looked back on her life and she shared with me, she goes, I have so much to be grateful for. I like, I had so many great experiences and, and, uh, and she shared it. But what she said was when I let go of you, when I kind of, when I leaned into everything is going to be okay, like life just got better. Yeah. Cause she, because she just reached a point. I, it's almost like the chapter when you, you know, don't let anyone fuck with your chi. When you get to the point of saying, you know what, everything is going to be okay, even if I'm in bottom, everything is going to be okay. Because when you can, what did Steve Jobs say when you connect the dots backward? And I think you said that earlier in the podcast, is to recognize that no matter what challenges, most of the time we get out of it. Yeah. The ones who don't is the ones who let melancholy take them down. Yeah. And, you know, my invitation for them is at least try to do some practice on a daily basis. Yeah, I, I, I agree. And, you know, what's ironic for me is, you know, it took my daughter's passing for me to understand everything's going to be okay. If somebody yeah. told me this, you know, six years ago, she passed, it'll be five years ago in June, I would have said, no, no, I, I don't believe that. But even though, you know, I, I said I would do anything to get her back, I would do anything to have her back. 
but um, I know everything will be okay. And I know she's still with me and we still have yeah. a relationship and that, you know, I will, I will see her again. And, and since I've been through this, everything else is nothing after that. Yeah. Hey, um, I don't know if we have enough time, but can I share something with your audience? Sure, uh, sure. So it's interesting because I shot a video uh, called What to Say and How to Date a Grieving Parent. I'd love mm -hmm. your feedback on this. So, because um, I'm single and dating, or I'm, I'm single and I'm out there. Mm -hmm. And I recognize that, you know, when it comes to talking about my son, it can be a little bit of a, you know, a, a sensitive subject. Yeah. In fact, one of the things when someone asks me, oh, tell me about your kids and they don't know yet, I always say, well, my oldest lives with my, his mom and my youngest lives in heaven. Mm -hmm. like, so that's my way of saying I don't have him around. So, but one of the things that happened in early on was when people kept saying, oh, I'm sorry for your loss. I'm sorry for your loss. I'm sorry for your loss. And I don't know why, but that triggered me because there's nothing for you to feel sorry about. And what I mean to say is you didn't do anything wrong. And I know the, the term I'm sorry can have multiple meanings. It right. bothered me. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't until one of my dear friends said to me, it was like three weeks after he passed and I saw him, he goes, Jonathan, there are no words. There are no words. And you're in my prayers. And can I give you a hug? And what I liked about that was when you say there's no words, it didn't require me to respond to him. Right. When he says you're in my prayers, it's like, wow, that feels like love. And he goes, can I give you a hug? That's loving. So, you know, when, when someone says, I'm sorry, it requires kind of a response back. But when someone said there are no words, it's exactly true. Like <laughs> there are no words. There's yeah. nothing you can say to me that's going to feel good. So if you just say there are no words, I get it. You're acknowledging it without, because you know, there's nothing you can say to change this. And so when it comes to dating a grieving parent, I certainly would encourage, that's my invitation. And mm -hmm. I don't know how you feel about it, but um, no, I think, just what you know, it's me. interesting because I, I wrote a book on grief and one of the things I talked about are things to say and things not to say to a grieving yeah. person. And the thing is, there are no words. And I, I said this, I think I said almost the exact same thing. Yeah. I don't know what to say. There are no words. That's the perfect thing to say because yes. there are no words and there's really nothing you can say. And me even being five years into this and dealing with the thousands of parents I've dealt with, I still sometimes say, I'm sorry for your loss because yeah. that's what everybody says. I know, you know? we're so conditioned for. So that, that does come out. But what I'll say is like, I know this is hard. You know, I'll say that to people sometimes. I don't know how you feel, you know, but I, I know this is hard, you know, just acknowledging their, their pain and that required them to, to come back with anything. Um, so, there, you, know, you know, things like that. We just acknowledge the person's feelings. Yeah. With, without, you know, but it's, it's, it's difficult. It's difficult for the other person to, it's hard for us as the griever, but for the other person, they don't know what to say. And yeah, you know, don't ask well, that's about why you. I like, there are no words. Yeah. You know, I, it's actually, I do. I liked it a lot, but yeah. I was at a dinner with someone and what I usually do, it depends on their relationship. You know, if I was at a dinner with a woman I was never going to see again. It was a, it was a business dinner thing. And we just happened to be sitting at the table with them. And she asked about my kids. I'll usually just say I have, you know, two daughters and blah, blah, blah. Then they'll say like, well, where did they go to school? Because she happened to live yeah. close to where I live. Yeah, so I'm yeah, like, yeah. and then finally, when they ask the third question, then I'm like, okay, well, Shana, you know, Shana's in spirit, you know? Yeah, yeah. Because I don't, because people get awkward when you tell them that your kids, you know, on the other side. So I don't, I don't lead with that. Yeah. If it's someone I'm not going to have an ongoing relationship with. Now, if it's someone I'm going to have a relationship with, then I'll just tell them up front, you know? Uh, I have a well, from a dating perspective, it's kind of one of those questions. Oh, how old are your kids? Blah, blah, blah. And right. It's yeah. Kind of like I, I feel and, and sometimes I actually give them the heads up before. Like sometimes I'll shoot even a text message. I'll just, you know, before I meet someone, I, I want you to know this ahead of time. And the reason why I even send it in an email or text, is because it gives them a second to process it. Yeah. Because when you're face to face with someone and they tell you this, it is, I, I can only, I'm, I'm, I'm not at the, well, I am at the receiving end because I experienced it with you, but I've, I, this is an experience I know. I, I can imagine how hard it is to hear that information. And again, they don't know what to do. It's almost like deer in the headlights. So right. I prepare them, at least from a dating perspective, a little heads up because I know that's a big, that's a big 
responsibility to navigate, you know, emotional I, I, responsibility. I agree. And that's, that's the only reason, because a lot of parents will ask me, so how do I respond when someone asks me, how many kids do I have? And I'm like, yeah. it's totally personal. It's up to you. And I suggest you rehearse it and think about it because it's going to happen. Yeah. And so I have, I, I have thought about that. And the reason I, I hold back with some people is not because I am feel, feel uncomfortable talking about Shannon because I don't feel uncomfortable at all. It's because I know it's going to make them feel uncomfortable. Yeah. I'm like, and what, what level of pain do I want to put them through if yeah. we're just having a conversation standing in line at the movies? You know, I, I'm yeah, not, exactly. I'm not going to go there with them. So that's, that's the way I handle it. Now, this is always, and, and that's the thing, you know, a lot of people, and I, I can already tell with you, uh, they feel like, like it's going to be uncomfortable for me to talk about it. It's quite the opposite. Oh, no. I want to talk about him. Ask me questions, you know, like you can say anything. In fact, I may feel a little sad for a moment because I'm, I'm missing him. But that's the other thing is, I, on some level, I'm like, I want you to ask me about him. Ask me tons, at least for me anyway. No, I, I think because it's, that keeps them alive for me. That's a that's a great point that we need to tell the people that don't know what to say to a grieving person. We don't feel uncomfortable talking about our kids, and we're always thinking about them. So yeah. don't think that you like, oh, I brought up something and I made you sad. No, they're always on our mind, and you didn't yeah. make me sad. Now you said I might, I might have, a, I might shed a tear because I'm thinking about her, or I'm thinking about her more on the surface, but. She's always with me. I mean, she's literally always with me. I, 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 go, I walk into a room, if there's a, a medium there, they're like, who's a little girl following you around? Because she's always with me. <laughs> so I know she's with me all the time. Well, that's, I, 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 I want to end, or I want to say that for those of us who are going through, you know, this loss, and I can, again, only speak for myself, I want my friends to ask me about them. I want them to, you know, bring them up. Um, because that lets me know that, you know, he's still around too, Yeah, you know, so those that feel afraid, I, I'm just going to encourage you to, you know, ask questions. Tell me a story about when he was five years old or, yeah. you know, tell me a story about her when she was six in sixth grade or whatever, yeah. you know, invite that conversation. Cause we're dying to talk about our kids, or at least Absolutely. I know I am. Absolutely. And I think everybody anyway, poor choice of words to say I'm dying to talk about. <laughs> yeah. No, I, but every every parent I've talked to, and I've talked to thousands, um, yeah. says that I want I want to talk about my kid. I like to talk about my kid. I don't I mean I think I, I shouldn't say every parent. Sometimes in the early stages I have had I have known parents that have said, you know, actually I, I did talk to a, a client that said, um, we don't bring them up. You know, her husband and her other son, they don't they don't bring them up. And I'm like, Yeah, this is something we need to work on. Yeah. Uh, because you know they're all walking around thinking about him but they don't talk about him yeah well jonathan we've been uh going about an hour now i really appreciate your time it's been great getting to know you um i want to um give your, your information again and then i'll ask you if you have anything you want to close with but your website is jonathan com. that's j-o-n-a-t-h-o-n-a-s-l-a-y.com i'll put that in the show notes uh the book is what the hell is what the heck is self-love anyway Sounds like a great book. So I encourage people to check it out. Yeah. Thank you so much. I'm so honored. I've really, it's, it's, I've, I've done a number of conversations around grief. It's, it's rare that I get to talk to someone who's in the same, and we have so much similarity here. Yeah. It's our, crazy. Our, our kids age and everything and, and, and it's the timing and whatnot. Um, so I'm really grateful that I had a chance to speak with you because this actually helped me feel better as well. So I just want you to know that. I'm very grateful. Well, awesome. You enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Likewise. Have a great day, everyone. <laughs> That's it for another episode of Grief to Growth. I sure hope you got something out of it. Please stay in contact with me by reaching out at www.grieftogrowth.com. That's grief, the number two, growth.com. Or you can text the word growth to 31996. That's simply text growth, G-R-O-W-T-H, to 31996. Since you're watching this on YouTube, please make sure you're subscribed. So hit the subscribe button and then hit the little bell here and it'll notify you when I have new content. Always please share the information if you enjoy it. That helps me to get more views and to get the message out to more people. Thanks a lot and have a wonderful day.